Hello, everyone, and welcome to Money Show's virtual event. I'm honored to introduce our next keynote speaker, the chief economist for NASDAQ, Mr. Phil McIntosh. Today, Mr. McIntosh is going to provide a view of the market from a macro perspective. At the end of the session, if there's time, we're going to take a question or two. So if you want to type them into the box on the right side of the platform, we'll look at that uh, a little later. And Mr. McIntosh, uh, thank you so much for being here. Please take it away. All right. Thanks very much. Let me just share my screen. And uh, it sure is an interesting time to talk about uh, the market and macro, having just had our first correction of a six month bull market and being half a year into a pandemic. Um, so let's kick it off by just looking at some of the records that were broken in the markets this year. And uh, I mean, obviously, a good place to start is to talk about the bear market, where we had um, the fastest bear market in history. And we've now had the fastest or the strongest bull market in history as well. So a lot of people who are talking about a V-shaped recovery in terms of the stock market, that's what we've gotten. Um, it's not necessarily as clear when you start to look at the economic data that that's what we're going to get those. And that's what we're going to spend some time talking about um, in a little bit. But first off, let's talk about the stock market and how it's behaved for the last six months. So if we look at this chart on the left, um, what you can see there is the volumes in the bar high. Um, the color of the bar is the intensity of return. So you can see that period from late February through March, huge volumes, almost record volumes, record value traded, and the volatility spiked, which are the black line and the blue line. Um, what's interesting is since everything has calmed down and we return back to a bull market uh, and we're sort of having a, a long-term rally, we've seen volatility come down, that's expected. Um, the realized volatility, which is the blue line, has come down much more than the implied volatility um, or the expected volatility that options are pricing in that you see in the VIX though. And that's pretty interesting. So we have elevated volume still and we have elevated volatility still, which typically signals that the market is still quite nervous. There is still a lot of price discovery happening. So even though the, the color of the bars in the last two or three months has gone pretty close to gray, which is muted to increases and decreases, you can see there's still a lot of uh, sort of apprehension in the market, if you like. And that elevated volatility that you can see in the VIX, another way to look at it is to look at previous market returns, which is the right-hand chart. And on days where you hit all-time highs in the market, um, what were the top 20 VIX points on those rally days? So typically, as the market's going up, the VIX is relatively low. But right now, we have the VIX relatively high for a bull market. And the last time that happened was back in the tech bubble. Um, so you can see that there's definitely some reasons for fear in the underlying market and in what the options are saying as well. What else has been changing um, this year? One of the big things that we've seen is a huge increase in retail trading. So the chart on the left, you can see the number of uh, average daily trades on the retail broker systems. And it started to increase late last year. You can see the move to zero commissions there at the end of Q3 into Q4 last year, sort of triggered a little bit of an increase in trading. But what we've really seen is since the pandemic um, caused a lot of people into quarantine, a big uptick in trading. Um, and that's continued for some of the brokers as well. So with the stimulus checks and with people sitting at home, um, with savings, which we'll talk about in a bit, actually elevated, um, it looks like a lot of people have come into the market um, and done quite a lot of trading. The retail brokers also reported um, record new account openings. So there's a lot of evidence that shows that um, retail customers are coming into the market at numbers we haven't seen before. Um, what else is interesting is looking at um, the options landscape. So the chart on the right here, um, you can see the blue line shows the proportion of all options tradings that are small trades compared to large trades, which is the pink. And so as we've seen this spike in retail activity, we've also seen a spike in uh, small options trades, which some would say is retail options trades as well. We can look at some of the other data on options trading and you see some interesting patterns. So uh, options trading uh, this year is at all time records. It's increased significantly. So even though the VIX is high and options are expensive, uh, a lot of people are actually trading options. Um, when you look at the mix of options trading on the right hand side, um, it's actually relatively quite a lot of single stock options and it's net call buys rather than put buys. So it's a fairly bullish position that people have been building in options. Um, some would say that might actually be contributing to some of the market moves we've had in the 
month or so where um, when the market goes up, it goes up a little bit more than expected because of the hedging that needs to be done on the back of a net call position. Um, and then obviously when the market sells off, you need to pull back on your hedge and sell some of that hedge. So uh, the, the large net call position could be affecting volatility if we're, uh, if we're looking carefully at things. But what's interesting is that not everyone has been a winner in this rally. Um, we talk a lot about the fact that the market, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100 are both back at all time highs in the last month. Um, but when you actually break things down, you see quite a dispersion across different styles and uh, different categories of investors and even different countries. So in this chart here, we're looking at um, a bunch of different styles. And you can see the NASDAQ 100 is, is up, well and truly up year to date. Um, the other category up is US large cap growth, which has significantly outperformed US large cap value down the bottom there in purple. Um, small cap has also not improved nearly as much as large cap. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. The other things that have gone well is gold, which is typically an inflation hedge and a protection hedge and a risk hedge has actually had a pretty stellar run this year um, without even selling off that much during the crisis. Um, while the dollar is starting to weaken and there's a few reasons for that, um, zero interest rate policy, which we'll talk about, uh, won't, won't help that either. So obviously a lot of different asset classes, a lot of different dispersions of performance if we look at it. So deep dive into the NASDAQ 100 outperformance though, um, you can see some tickers that are becoming household names. So when you think about this chart, we've got index weight on the horizontal and you've got year to date return on the vertical. So the bigger the stock, um, the easier it is for it to help the index go up, but the more the stock goes up, obviously that'll contribute as well. So if you kind of look at this on a diagonal, um, the stocks like Zoom and Moderna and DocuSign and Nvidia, um, perfectly positioned for the uh, coronavirus pandemic from working from home. Um, and so they've had stellar returns that helped the NASDAQ 100 outperform, but also Amazon and Apple and Microsoft um, have had good returns and benefited from being well positioned for online retail, um, from people using Teams and, and sort of working remotely as well. So a lot of the new economy stocks are the stocks that are helping the NASDAQ 100 and the US large cap indexes outperform. And it's important sort of to recognize that. So now let's switch and talk a little bit about COVID-19 and what it's done to the underlying economics. Um, so obviously back in March, COVID-19 hit the US and it caused a dramatic, in case we've forgotten, um, reduction in businesses, reduction in uh, sort of worked hours. You can see in the chart on the left, in a space of two weeks, 50% of small businesses were shut down. And that was the right thing to do for the economy, uh, or for, I guess for the health of the society, um, but it's potentially damaging for the economy if it stays that way for too long. What's interesting is around about that time, obviously a lot of countries were dealing with coronavirus and a lot of countries have dealt with it in different ways. There wasn't much information about it because it was obviously the new coronavirus. And so when you look at the, the right-hand chart, which shows the amount of infections per head, um, the US, Brazil, um, Russia and the UK are four examples of countries that kind of started to think maybe they could create herd immunity or just learn to live with coronavirus and not shut the economy down quite as aggressively as some other countries. And so you can see the impact of that attitude filtering through some of their economies later. Um, arguably Spain and Italy uh, had the cases early enough that they didn't know how to deal with it as successfully as some of the other countries later on. Uh, which we'll talk about as well. So you can kind of see that the different approaches to coronavirus have had a different impact on countries and their economics as well. Moving forward from March, um, we started to see some studies that helped us understand how coronavirus really worked. And so if you look at the chart on the, or the two diagrams on the left, they're um, floor plans. The left floor plan is a Korean office space. And so you can see that even though there's a lot of people sitting on one floor, it was only one half of the floor that had a super spreader event. So some of the things that people were worried about, bathrooms being shared, kitchens being shared, conference rooms being shared, doesn't seem to be nearly as risky as sitting in the same air conditioning space as somebody else. And that's consistent with the middle diagram, um, which is a restaurant in China, which shows that a lot of people sitting underneath one air conditioner all caught coronavirus from a single spreader um, and so we've seen a lot of events that show that um, air-conditioned spaces, small spaces, um, 
where people are talking loudly, potentially drinking. Uh, we've had a lot of spread in nightclubs, a lot of spread is in pubs, uh, are the most dangerous places in terms of containing super spreader events. In contrast, if you look at the right hand charts, um, a classic example of outdoor activities like the Black Lives Matter protests really didn't lead to an uptick in cases at all. Uh, and so we're starting to see pretty clearly that outdoor activities are much safer to do than indoor activities. We've also started to learn um, that obviously there is asymptomatic contagion that can spread coronavirus before they know they've got it. Um, that's important because one of the things that Taiwan did really successfully was to test people at immigration as they entered the country and to turn people around before they came into the country with coronavirus. Arguably, a lot of the um, travel restrictions that the world has had came in a bit too late. And we know that traveling internationally and, and people that were asymptomatic are able to be super spreaders um, and sort of get the virus going before anybody was aware that it was going to be a problem. The other thing that we've learned is that masks really do help. So uh, I, there's actually some evidence coming out right now that if you have a mask on, you might still get some coronavirus in you, but you might get a small enough dose that you start to uh, ha have basically a mild case of it and build some immunity that way. Uh, without masks, you're much likely to catch it when you're in proximity with people faster. And so that's been really important for countries in Asia where they were much quicker to put masks on and they've been able to contain some of the outbreaks to regions and leave the rest of the economy functional, where they've been much more um, adaptable and able to go back to work with masks on just because socially it's more acceptable. Uh, and they haven't had super spreader cases in the office space as much as some of the other countries around the world. It's also arguably why Europe has been able to have a reasonable travel season during the summer. Um, because they adopted masks and got the, the, the coronavirus levels down to a low enough level um, that the people traveling didn't take too much of it with them. Although we are starting to see an uptick in cases um, in some of the European countries. And in fact, if we look at this chart on the left, you can see Spain is now having more new coronavirus cases per day in the blue line um, than they had when they had their previous spike. What's really interesting about what's happening in Spain though is the mortality rates, which is the black line on the left hand side. So, the first time around, there was a lot of mistakes made in hospitalization and in treatment. We didn't really know what would work. We found out steroids were quite helpful. We found out the incubation wasn't as helpful as we thought it would be. The second time around, um, hospitalization is much better at dealing with uh, the new cases. People are coming out of hospitals. People aren't dying of coronavirus nearly as much, which reduces the risk and increases the things that we can do economically uh, without putting so much of society at risk. Also, arguably, what's happened in Europe is that travel season uh, has sort of started to respread the virus around different countries, uh, but it's younger people that are catching it and transferring it, and so their mortality is lower as well. But you can see in the chart on the right, um, even the hospitalizations has fallen. And so definitely it seems like the, the, the second wave that's happening in Europe is not nearly as harmful as the first wave. Sort of pivoting a little bit, um, what's interesting thinking about countries that didn't put lockdowns in place is that the society still could read the paper and they still were very pr protective of their own health. So Sweden is a case where um, there was no lockdowns, there was no quarantining, but uh, the household consumption still fell by around 10% in a quarter. Uh, so it really what you see is once cases pick up, it doesn't matter what the, uh, the government policy is, people's behavior changes. In fact, you can even see that on the chart on the right, um, which is looking at China, which within a month or two had pretty much um, dealt with coronavirus via very strict lockdowns and was able to start doing business as usual pretty quickly. And yet what you see is some behaviors like driving a car to work were very quick to get back to normal. And in the US actually, we've seen that get to um, more than normal. But other activities like subway usage and especially air travel where you're stuck in a a small confined space for a long time with people um, were much slower for people to, to pick up. And so you can start to see already different segments of the economy are faster to recover even when coronavirus risks have gone away. So if we look at the US data, we kind of see some of the similar patterns. Um, on the left-hand chart, we can see hotel occupancy never went straight to zero, um, but it's been very slow to recover. And, there's evidence that the hotel occupancy is still seeing big discounts on per room rates, uh, 
as well as being relatively empty um, compared to normal levels. But you look at restaurant dinners, which um, indoor restaurant dinners went basically to zero for April and May, they recovered really quickly, especially once we hit summer, once we saw the news about working and, and sitting outside being safer, until we had that second wave of cases in America. And you can see people's reactions in that pivot point in the black line, uh, where all of a sudden they became much more risk averse, stopped going out to restaurants. Um, now that the cases are getting back under control in the US, we're starting to see an uptick again in restaurant dinners. Um, but air travel, um, much slower, just like China, to recover, and it has stalled as well with the new uptick in cases. So you can start to see, even with different policies in different countries, the human reactions are quite predictable and quite consistent. In terms of picking stocks in the market, uh, you can start to see some patterns there as well. So retail sales have actually recovered back to pre-COVID levels, but when you break down how those sales have worked, you can see that in-store retail is now well below pre-COVID levels, around about 10% below, while online is about 20% above. So clearly companies that have been able to position for online, some of those companies we talked about in the NASDAQ 100 driving its returns, um, like Amazon, have positioned themselves or been lucky to be in the right position to benefit from coronavirus. Uh, while other companies, there's been a, a raft of retail companies um, filed for Chapter 11, um, the bricks and mortar stores really struggling. We can also break down the, the bounce back in spending by income level. And what that shows is the green, which is the low income um, earners, were pretty quick to get back to um, you know, spending as normal. But obviously with low income, they're not buying as many luxury goods. They're buying more staples than discretionaries. Uh, and so the, uh, the sort of companies that are gonna benefit from the bounce back are much more likely to be staples companies, uh, more, more uh, durable goods. We can also see when we look at the right-hand chart here, um, the spending on services is still well below the pre-coronavirus levels. And if you remember, before coronavirus, consumer confidence was driving spending, services was where the spending was strongest. And so the services sector had low unemployment, which boosted consumer confidence, kept revenues strong in companies. Um, the services sector really was responsible for the US rally that sort of continued right through into early 2020. Now what we're seeing is actually the bounce back or the V-shaped recovery has happened in goods. And we've got goods above average, um, not services. So the economy has changed significantly um, in this post-coronavirus world. And so that's reflected um, in spending across different sectors and different segments of the economy. Obviously groceries, um, people trying to do hobbies or outdoor sports together, um, bicycle sales are, are very strong compared to normal. Um, restaurants have actually recovered uh, primarily because they've been able to move to outdoor eating. So um, there's going to be obviously more challenges when we hit winter for restaurants. Um, but on the flip side, you've got a lot of transportation, travel, um, leisure, uh, you know, attending sporting events are all down dramatically still. And so those sectors of the economy um, are, are looking more likely to have long term unemployed, to have longer term balance sheet stress and long term missing revenues, which is important. Uh, when we're looking at what stocks we want to do. From an economic perspective, uh, why I guess is more important is where the people are employed. And so if we look at the, um, the retail sector, you can see that food and drink is that big circle down the bottom. And so they've seen a 50% reduction in sales and a 50% reduction in employment, but that's a big chunk of employment. And that's why it's really important that we can work out how to get some operations of, of those businesses, of hotels and travel, um, back to as close to normal as possible safely um, so that people feel comfortable doing things like food and, and drink, like restaurants, um, without necessarily uh, you know, keeping them shut down completely because they employ so many people. So I think there's um, probably three longer term risks that are really worth thinking about as we kind of look forward to the market. Uh, one is related to the huge amount of stimulus that's being put into the system. So what's amazing is that in April, May and June, people's income actually increased. Um, and that's because mostly because of all of the stimulus payments that were put into the system. Uh, what we actually found uh, when was that the money supply, no doubt, increased significantly as well. And you know, going back decades, the amount of new money pumped into the system um, is at record levels. Now, typically, when money supply increases that much, but the supply of goods and services doesn't increase, 
you end up with inflation. That amount of money supply has to be squeezed into all the old goods. And so the prices of the goods increase essentially to make up for um, the money supply increase. What's actually happened this time around is people have been saving the money. And so very similar to um, back in the, the Second World War, people have been getting those income and saving it, which has actually stopped it from circulating and it stopped the money supply from having that multiplier effect that would create inflation so far. And in fact, what a lot of people were initially saying is the demand in the economy was so weak that we wouldn't get inflation because there just wasn't enough people demanding goods and demanding services. We've actually seen inflation stay moderate um, because of, of uh, groceries going up and oil is now starting to go up again as well. Um, but what we haven't seen is that savings rate and the money supply sort of starting to escalate through the system. But if we get inflation, um, that has a whole lot of implications for valuations of stocks and for bond repayments as well, um, which we'll get to. I think the second risk is that we have a real recession. And so remember, we talked about the fact that um, the services sector was being driven by the consumer confidence and the consumer confidence was keeping unemployment low. Um, and, and all of that was helping the, the market rally really from 2009 through to 2019. That red line that shows the consumer confidence index climbing pretty closely matched what the stock market did. And obviously that stops. So consumer confidence has fallen significantly. Um, what remains to be seen is what the consumer, obviously the retail spending has recovered, but will the consumer spending come back um, in meaningful ways if people aren't going to get jobs back? And so that's why it's important to look at what's going on with unemployment. Um, obviously, we've seen record drawdowns in unemployment off the charts, new claims per week. So we've had very strong, the, the red line on the left hand chart there, uh, increase in unemployment. We've seen it bounce back pretty quickly. We're sort of on a V-shaped trajectory right now, but those gains are starting to get harder. And so what's interesting right now, we're kind of at that pivot point where we may get stuck with sort of, we're around about 8%. We may get stuck at five or 6% in unemployment rather than get right back to where we were um, before. And that could be more like a classic recession where uh, people don't spend and confidence doesn't return because they're not sure about their job security. And so that leads to lower revenues, which leads to some more layoffs. End up with what's more classic recession drawn out um, rather than what we've got right now, which is a huge amount of fiscal stimulus, people feeling like they're in temporary unemployment and willing to keep spending in the short term. One of the reasons I think to be a little nervous is the right hand chart, just looking at small business. Um, small businesses have not recovered as well as big business. Um, their sales have recovered better than their employment expectations. And in fact, the whole economy, production levels um, and sales levels and retail spend has recovered more than um, actual underlying employment levels. So productivity looks like it's going up. Um, but what's happening underneath is that there's not strong re replacement in unemployment coming through the system just yet. And part of the reason for that is a lot of those people that are in those sectors that have potential to be longer term unemployed, um, that, that have a longer tail in terms of confidence recovering to their industries are in lower paid jobs, uh, but there's more of them. So there's quite a long tail to the unemployment story. Um, the third factor is obviously the debt. And so the debt load is running with all of the, the stimulus and the potential additional stimulus that we're, we're being talked about in DC this week, uh, sort of world war levels of debt. Now, obviously we've been here before, um, but typically when we see debt this large, government debt this large, we do see inflation after it. Um, we have after both world wars, we have in the past, we've had large debt drawdowns. Um, so that's one thing just historically that makes people feel like we probably will see inflation once things start to recover and once the spending uh, of all of this stimulus money re returns to the system. But the flip side as well is um, inflation could actually be good for repayment of the debt because it effectively devalues the value of all these bonds being issued in tomorrow's dollars. Um, so one way that a lot of countries, maybe not so much the US, but a lot of other countries in the world might be able to afford this huge amount of stimulus is if we see inflation. It'll be much easier in 10 years to pay off the current amount of debt if GDP has doubled in notional terms, even if it hasn't doubled in real terms. So inflation on one hand is a negative for investors. It's making it much harder to earn income on bond assets. 
Um, arguably in the short term, it's more likely to make interest rates go up, uh, which is more likely to make the discount factors on stocks or stock valuations to go down, but companies can revalue and reprice their earnings. And so companies are probably better positioned to cope with inflation than bond markets. Um, and so there's a lot of redistribution that are likely to happen if we do see significant inflation. But it's not just the federal government that's borrowed a lot of money. Right now, there's obviously discussions at state level on how they're going to fund next year's budget. And state governments are big employers. They've been big re-employers during this crisis. So a lot of the, the jobs that have been created have actually been created in the government sectors. And if the governments, if the state governments can't fund their budgets, we may see um, later this year or early next year, some waves of retrenchment coming through the government cycle, which again could lead to some of the recessionary risks and the longer term unemployed risks that we just talked about. And then on the corporate side, the fact that we've had low interest rates for the last decade has led to a huge increase in debt financing of businesses. Um, it's, it's led to an explosion of relatively low quality credit, which in the past 10 years has not had defaults. But you can see from the chart on the right, a lot of the banks are starting to increase provisions for bad debt. We've seen a lot of retail companies, um, some oil companies that are really badly affected by coronavirus already far for bankruptcy. And so we're starting to see some of those credit default events filter into the system already. And again, that itself could lead to a more classic recession where we have some credit risk and some defaults and some negative earnings in other segments of the economy because of the, the debt load. So let's get back to the markets really quickly. There was an interesting study done by Bank of America recently that showed that over the long term, if you're looking at company valuations, earnings per share explain a lot of company price moves. And so we've known this, you know, earnings are a key reason why we focus so much on the price earnings ratio, for example. We also know that global earnings have been significantly hit by the coronavirus. So the right hand chart, you can see a lot of earnings are down 20, 30, even 40%. Where is the disconnect in what the market is showing? Well, clearly the market is good at pricing things forward. So the market knows earnings should recover. If we have a V-shaped recover, they'll recover quickly. If we have inflation, they'll recover even more than the, the level of earnings before. And so that's one of the factors that's driving the valuations of the market right now. Another factor that's driving valuations right now is the zero interest rate policy. And so when you look at the valuation multiple, um, of companies. Obviously, if the, if the interest rate for risk-free assets falls, then the discount factor that you apply to valuations makes it easier for growth assets to have pretty significant outperformance. And so as real interest rates, I'm not saying no, notional, but real interest rates go negative, which they are right now, you can see that on the right-hand chart, um, the 10-year rate now is at a, a pretty significant negative interest rate. Um, what you tend to see is that supports higher valuations, it supports higher EPS multiples and PE multiples. And so where we've gone um, actually in the last uh, uh, sort of four or five months is from the old yellow now but, but block to around about the green cross, but still supported by the fact that we have such negative real rates, um, we can support the PE multiples that we have in the system. Um, so the question really is, what is gonna happen to inflation? Is that gonna affect interest rates? Is it gonna affect revenues? There's a lot of unknowns in the system um, and with a lot of potential impact on valuations of stocks. So I wanted to finish just by sort of bringing this all back together. Um, obviously markets have had a really V-shaped recovery, a very good recovery. The underlying economics is not nearly as strong. Um, we can see headwinds starting to form. We can see some industries with longer tailwinds to recovery. Um, but when you look at some charts of valuations market-wide, um, it's possible to show right now that the market is quite expensive. It's also possible to show that it's relatively cheap. The people that say it's expensive are looking at those classic recession risks where um, we have PE ratios that are relatively extended. They're justified by the low interest rates um, that might then be coming back up because of inflation. Um, there's worries that the amount of debt will actually cause um, uh, interest rates to rise as well, and we're going to have longer term unemployment. On the cheap side, the inflation itself is probably something that's going to justify revenue growth and earnings growth back to above pre-coronavirus levels. 
the stimulus in the system is something that it's hard to ignore um, and it's going to have a major impact. It's already had a pretty decent impact on retail spending, um, but it's likely to have a pretty big impact on um, the level of valuations of companies if all of that stimulus comes back into the system. Zero interest rates, we saw the Fed last week or the week before um, talk about a new, more inflation-friendly approach, which means that they're going to have less pressure to increase interest rates, even if we start to see some inflation. And so we look like we're going to have zero interest rates for longer, which helps, again, support those valuations at higher levels. And of course, the other thing we haven't talked about um, is when will the vaccine happen? And if we have a vaccine before the end of the year, if a lot of people have been uh, immunized you know, mid, mid next year, we are relatively back to normal. All of those long tail um, sectors of the economy, all those old economy uh, metrics, the oil sector, the transport, utilities, um, the, uh, the energy sector should all be on the recovery track. Um, and we've seen fits and starts of that trade coming through with ETF trading um, and with performance. Um, but all of those things could make a major difference to valuations going forward as well. And that is really the $4 trillion question. <laughs> hey, that's fantastic. Wonderful presentation.